All right. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Main Street Baptist Church. Uh, we are continuing on with this little study on hermeneutics, uh, which is just principles of interpretation. And today we are still in the heart of the uh, hermeneutics class as we're talking about interpretation, uh, specifically interpretation, bridging gaps. Uh, tonight, uh, the lecture proceeds on this basic assumption that there are gaps, that there are gaps between us and between the original writers, just as there's a gap between us and the author. Uh, the good news, though, is while we assume the gaps, we also assume that the gaps are bridgeable. Uh, this is sort of a theological commitment that we come to the Scriptures with, and that is that God is entirely capable of bridging the gaps. He bridges the gap over His Son's broken body and shed blood, and He bridges the gap between us and Himself in terms of this special revelation we call the Holy Scriptures. So while we assume that there are gaps between us and those to whom God originally gave the text, we also assume that the gap can be bridged. So we proceed in the interpretive process with a certain amount of humility, recognizing we are not yet understanding. But we also proceed in this hermeneutic task with this conviction that absolutely we can understand not because we are so great and wonderful, but because God is gracious enough to communicate with clarity. So there is not only this tension between the uh, time in which we find ourselves and the time in which God brings this original record of revelation, uh, but there's not just that, that humility and that, that gap, there's this confidence that because fundamentally we're human beings, we are like those to whom God originally spoke. So we're excited about the process, uh, but we also recognize there has to be some work that is done on our part in order to understand appropriately. Uh, so I hope that you enjoy the lecture tonight uh, from Dr. Aiken. Uh, he is a professor, actually he is the president of Southeastern Seminary. Uh, so if you haven't been tuned in, hopefully you'll enjoy tonight, take a few notes, and at the end of the session, Mark and I will try to flesh out a few things that are being discussed. So go ahead and roll that video. Thanks. All right. Uh, ten interpretive rules for interpreting a text. Uh, just as there must be the proper use of the proper tools. There must also be the observance of some simple rules if accurate interpretation is to take place. Remember, hermeneutics is both, this is a test question, I assure you, an art and a science. It's an art because you get better at it by doing it, but it's a science because there are certain principles and, and good solid rules that we follow to help us get at the authorally intended meaning of the text. And there are ten of them that I would put out here before you. Number one. Work from the assumption that the Bible is authoritative. In other words, I believe you should operate from the perspective that the Bible is indeed true. It is the infallible and inerrant Word of God. So that when I come to uh, difficulties, uh, I assume there's a resolution. Uh, when I come to something that appears to be a contradiction, I think it appears to be a contradiction, but I don't believe it is one. And I'll just say this to you, 37 years into this, and I'll throw the gauntlet down with any of you right now. Uh, bring me an alleged contradiction, and I promise you the next day I'll bring you back a plausible, not just possible, I'll bring you back a plausible uh, resolution. Uh, when I first taught here back in 1992, I taught a class one summer on the doctrine of revelation. And uh, I gave our class a, a book uh, that was written by a man that uh, cataloged 100 or 120, was one or the other, uh, errors in the Bible, contradictions in the Bible. And so I think there were uh, about 12 students in the class, so I gave each one of them 10. And I said, you get these 10, you get these 10, you get these 10. Uh, and one of your writing assignments is to see if you can find a plausible, uh, even highly probable, uh, resolution to this alleged uh, error or contradiction or mistake uh, in the Bible. And uh, 
they all were able to do it. In fact, most of them came back and said, I did not even need to go to a commentary to find a resolution. If you just read the whole Bible in its context, it resolved itself. Uh, and so I have always believed that, uh, that, that the word is true. Sure, there's still some things that we don't know absolutely for certain what is the best resolution of an issue, but over and over and over and over, uh, the Bible uh, through archaeology and through additional historical research has proven itself to be true. If you want a book that's really uh, helpful on this, it's probably the Mac Daddy. Uh, Gleason Archer wrote a book called Bible Difficult or Biblical Difficulties. It's a big old thing. And he simply goes through almost the totality of Scripture. He doesn't get all of them, but he gets most of them and shows you where here's an alleged uh, contradiction or a problem, and then here is a very plausible resolution. So in other words, I don't approach the Bible with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Uh, I give it the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and I'll tell you that, where, where you start will determine where you end up. If you begin with suspicion, I'm looking for contradictions, you'll find them. If you come to the Bible believing I can find a resolution, at least at this point in time in my life, I've been able to find those as well. Secondly then, interpret difficult passages in light of the more clear passages. Let the Bible interpret itself. I think I mentioned earlier, don't build a doctrine on baptism from 1 Corinthians 15, 29, which talks about baptism for the dead. Uh, there are in excess of 50 different interpretations as to what that particular passage means. Uh, you can narrow it down, I think, to two or three of the most likely, and I can assure you this, you can rule out what the Mormons do in baptizing for people that have died so that you can somehow move them from one spiritual status to another, but you allow the more clear text on baptism, for example, to uh, enlighten our mind, and then you interpret that text in light of those. Number three, interpret personal experience in the light of Scripture, not Scripture in the light of personal experience. Now cut to the chase. If your personal experience contradicts the Bible, it's your experience that's wrong. Not the Bible, your experience. And I will assure you guys and gals that you're going to run into people in ministry. They're going to tell you that God told them to do something or God gave them permission to do something or they just feel like it's okay with God to, for them to do something. And they're allowing their experience to override what the scriptures clearly teach. A classic will be when you have somebody come to you and say, well, I just believe God has given me permission to leave my spouse and marry this pretty young thing that I have met up with or this nice wealthy fellow over here or this guy that will talk to me since my husband doesn't or whatever. And folks, the bottom line is the Bible doesn't say anything like that uh, at best, at best. And I do hold to the exception clauses. I think the Bible allows for, does not require, but allows for divorce when there is uh, desertion uh, by an uh, uh, unbeliever are there sexual immorality? Now, I know at least two, maybe three of my ethics professors don't agree with me. They hold to a more restrictive view, that is, there is no allowances for divorce and remarriage under any circumstances, and I certainly respect that view and know how they get there, but I think the Bible does allow for, it doesn't require. And in fact, I've never counseled anyone to get a divorce, ever. I've counseled separation, I've counseled women in particular, to get a warrant and have a, an abusive husband arrested. Uh, I've certainly done that, uh, but I've never counseled anyone uh, to get a divorce. I always pray and hold out for what I believe God wants us to pray and hold out for, and that is reconciliation. Still, uh, I do think the Bible allows it in those two particular instances. But again, personal experience does not interpret Scripture. Scripture informs and interprets your experience, all right? Number four, remember that Scripture has only one meaning, but it has many applications. Now, that one meaning may have a more, what we call a more full meaning, and the technical phrase is census planor, which means fuller, a fuller sense. And what I mean by that is a passage may have a more full meaning than the author originally understood or intended. 
classic example again would be Isaiah 53, uh, Psalm 110. Your messianic passages in particular, I think, fill out more meaning than the uh, Old Testament authors understood. Is it a different meaning? No. It's a more full meaning. And I use the analogy a lot of times of, of an iceberg, and you will have to excuse my lack of artistic ability, but this is the ocean, okay? That's the ocean. And this is an iceberg. <laughs> now, question. Is most of the iceberg above or below the surface? Below. This is analogous to what I mean by a more full meaning. It's not a different iceberg. It's not like, well, in the Old Testament, this meant iceberg. But in the New Testament, it means boat. No, 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 no. It's the same iceberg. It's just as we have the blessing and the joy of the totality of God's revelation, His progressive revelation kept on unfolding, uh, the, uh, the, the, the saints saw more and more and more of the iceberg. Now, I would not even say now that we've got the whole puppy exhausted. Uh, I will say, though, in terms of God's written revelation, we've got the whole thing. And so we have the ultimate advantage of looking back on everything as they were in something of a disadvantage looking as it came forward. That's one of the reasons why I do like to pick at the apostles when they mess up. But, I mean, let's cut them some slack. Uh, they didn't see things like we do. They, they weren't on this side of the cross in the empty tomb. Uh, they weren't on this side of having all of God's revelation complete. So we recognize that there's one meaning, though it may be a more full meaning as revelation unfolds, but there are many applications. In fact, I would say virtually uh, applications can be unlimited because of time, because of culture. Uh, and so I would never want to say, well, you can only have like 25 uh, applications from this particular. I would not say that. Uh, because I think we can't make a judgment like that. So, one meaning, many applications. That's why you, you should never be in a Bible study and you ask somebody, well, what does this text mean to you? That's a bad question. It means what it means. And I know that's a tautology, but it means what it means. Now, how does it apply to you? Well, my goodness, yes, that can apply in lots of different ways, depending upon your sex, your age, your marital status, and on and on and on and on and on and on. So, many applications, one meaning, all right? Number five, interpret words and passages in harmony with their meaning in the time of the author. That's why you want to take advantage of lexicons, uh, Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias, why you want to read good critical commentaries. And by critical, I don't mean they're criticizing. I mean they are dealing with the text uh, grammatically, linguistically, within its historical context because words have a meaning, and I used the analogy last week of a hussy. Uh, they have a meaning in their particular historical context. So that's what we are trying to get at. Now there are gaps then you have to recognize that you and I uh, have the challenge of overcoming. The language gap. Uh, all of us in here speak English. Uh, the Old Testament was written in uh, Hebrew, it's portions of Daniel and Aramaic. New Testament was written in Greek, uh, a few portions in Aramaic and a few Latinisms there. So there is a language gap. Any of you that have studied linguistics know that there is a challenge when you move from one language to another. Some words just don't come straight across. They just don't. And so you've got to find sometimes several words to capture what was meant by a single word in a different language. Uh, the historical gap. Um, taking conservative dating like I would. Uh, Moses is the first writer of the Bible. He's writing around 1400 B.C. And you come all the way up to about 400 B.C. when Malachi writes, and then you're through with the Old Testament. You have what's called the 400 silent years where the prophetic voice is, is, is not speaking. But you're talking about something that was written, we're now in, what, the year 2014? Uh, 3,500 years ago with certain passages of the Bible, even the New Testament, you're 2,000 years ago. And so there's this historical difference. And furthermore, those of us that have grown up in America, we think in such radically democratic, autonomous categories. Hardly any of the rest of the world thinks like that. Now, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad we're here. I, I'm a big fan of democracy. Big fan of, you know, having a republic. I, I'm all for that. I, I like it. I'm glad I'm here, not somewhere else. But the fact of the matter is, most of the rest of the world thinks far more communally. That They think far more in terms, they're comfortable with the idea of a potentate. 
a king, a queen, uh, someone that has that kind of authority. Again, this is for free. I think it's one of the reasons we are having such problems uh, in Iraq uh, when we try to bring in, rightly I think, in one sense, democracy. They don't think in democratic categories. They just don't. They haven't ever. And so now we're trying to bring into them, and it really is not uh, indigenous to the Muslim way of thinking with their whole understanding of Allah and how Islam is to spread and conquer the world, which is what they believe. Well, it just doesn't make sense. And they struggle with it, and we were watching it. In fact, name me today outside of Turkey, which is a very, very secular Islam, tell me where there is a healthy democratic government that uh, is in a country that's predominantly Islamic. I'm, at, I'm serious. Anybody, anybody say, well, here's this one. I mean, I don't know any. And I'm not, being, uh, not making a, a judgment. I'm just making an observation that that's just something that their mind does. Those categories don't naturally work for them because that's not how they thought for literally thousands of years, certainly hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, you have then the cultural gap. You've got a Hebrew world. You've got the Greco-Roman world with the uh, Roman Empire. And you have us, as I mentioned a moment ago, 21st century democracy with uh, autonomous man sitting at the top of his throne. The geographical gap. Uh, I, I don't worry about this one as much. But uh, geography sometimes will impact the way you understand the text and the world of the Middle East. Far, far, far different than the world here, even Israel. Any of y'all ever been to Israel? Real quickly, so just a couple. Uh, the north is like here. If you're in Galilee, it looks like this. It's beautiful, it's green, it's lush, got the Sea of Galilee. About halfway down, I mean, I, it's fun when you go, you watch it, it just turns all of a sudden, boom, desert. Just desert. No trees, lots of rock. Lots of dirt. And now I really do understand more carefully uh, and better the, the whole story of the Good Samaritan and the guy that got whooped going down to Jericho. Because you always go from Jerusalem down. Jericho is the lowest city in the world in terms of sea level. It's like a, almost a thousand feet below sea level. And there is still there the old Jericho Road. Well, it's a really easy place for robbers to hide and come out and whoop you and beat you up. And you're left there to die. And it's just barren. There's just, there's just nothing there. You also understand why the Bible, and in particular Jesus, over and over and over talks about water. Water. Water today is a precious, precious commodity in Israel because the only fresh water source they have is the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee has been shrinking, 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 shrinking for a long, long time. And so you're down there in Judea in this wilderness, in this desert, and water's like gold. I mean, you got water, you're wealthy. You got water, you're in good stead. So that geographical gap, the literary gap, a classic. How many of y'all talk in chiasms? How many of you, when you talk, say, well, I start with the main idea, go to the sub-idea, hit the main point, come back with the main point, then come back with this that parallels this and this that parallels that. How many of you talk like that? How many of you even write like that? Well, the answer is none of you. The Bible does it all the time. Now, there are people that have chiastic itis, and they find chiasms, chiasms everywhere. Every book's a chiasm. Every paragraph's a chiasm. Eh, probably not. Uh, but they are there. Uh, in fact, I don't know that this is the case with Ephesians, but when you find an idea that starts the text, like walking, and you find an idea that concludes that paragraph about walking, eh, you might say, mm, well, it might be. I don't think it is, but it, be, but, but it might be. Uh, apocalyptic literature. My goodness, none of us write like that. Closest thing you've got today are these whack jobs that do this crazy science fiction stuff, and they come up with all this crazy stuff. Uh, you know, Lewis tried to get at it. Toy can try to get at it a little bit, but th th even they aren't doing what John's doing in Revelation. My goodness gracious. And Daniel, too, and parts of Ezekiel and Isaiah. We don't, we don't write like that. We don't think like that. So there's a, there's a challenge there. We also write letters like Paul did. How many of you start your letters? Danny Aiken to uh, Charlotte Tammy Bourne, uh, grace and peace from your future husband. And No, I, don't, yeah, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I said, you know, dear Charlotte, 
uh, or do like Platt did. I still can't believe he did this. Uh, he shared this in chapel. Uh, when he was in college, he was lonely. Heather was back in high school. So he writes her a love letter, and he starts off. He, he's got it reading it. He starts off, hey, dude, how you going? <laughs> hey, dude. That's, that's what you say from a guy to a guy. You don't call your, the girl you want to marry, hey, dude. I mean, what is what kind of loose screw did he have in his brain back then? Fortunately, he went to Georgia and got three degrees, and it fixed it. But anyway, uh, I mean, you know. You don't write like that. We, we start off to we write it. We put our names at the end. And so we don't write like that. So when you come to Paul's letters, they're, they're different. And you have to take that into consideration. And then the theological gap, which really impinges on number six. You want to interpret Scripture in light of its progressive revelation, recognizing it's unfolding over time. It is becoming more full more complete. You have to be careful not to read back into passages what you should, but at the same time, I absolutely agree with Kevin Van Huser that you interpret every text in light of the totality of Scripture. In other words, we do have the whole book now. And therefore, when we read Act 25 in wherever, uh, that still is going to inform... We, we can then go, oh, so that's sort of what was going on back then that they didn't see as clearly, but I do now because I've read the whole book. I, in other words, I've gone to the end, and I know how it ends. Now I can go back and read the parts, and the parts have a more full meaning than the initial author understood. That's all we're saying there. Seven, remember you must understand the Bible grammatically before you can understand it theologically. Um, I love theology. Obviously, I, I used to teach it, uh, help edit a book on it. Well, when it comes to doing theology, I believe it works like this. You start off with historical, grammatical <coughs> interpretation, which then leads you to do biblical theology, which then will lead you to be able to do systematic theology. Now, I don't care who you are. I don't care, and this is again for free. When it comes to you being a theologian, and we're all called to be theologians. I had a professor at Southern one time that was doing some little weird stuff in class, and uh, one of his students pushed him on an issue, and he said, well, if you interpret that like this, and you interpret this like this, then there's a problem. And he said, well, it's not my problem to resolve uh, difficulties. That's what the theologians do. So I called him in. And I said, look, uh, number one, uh, that's sloppy. That's sloppy. I said, because the fact of the matter is, all of us are theologians, just like all of us are exegetes. Now, some of us give more time to one than the other, but I don't care if you're in here and you wind up doing a PhD in Hebrew and you study Aramaic, Eucharitic, and Akkadian, and you become the wingding in that area, you're still a theologian, all right? And I don't care if you are a great theologian who knows how to synthesize everything and you've got this really good mind that allows you to do that. If you're not doing this, you're going to screw up down here. You just are. So you work your way down in this way. Now, here's my point. You will either gravitate, just how we're wired. You will either gravitate more toward this or this. Now, you've got to do both. But the fact of the matter is, some of you are just so driven. Some of you engineer types. Some of you uh, accountant types, you just want everything nice and neat and clean in a theological box. That's just how you're wired. And so you're going to push, you're going to push, you're going to push, you're going to push, and you're going to take some text and you're going to make them squeal like a pig to fit into that box, but they don't fit. They just don't fit. Others of you will be more comfortable here. And what that means is you'll live with a little bit more tension your system, at least around the edges, won't be quite as nice and neat and clean and tight. But, okay, God's God. He knows everything. I'm a human. I don't. I can live with that. I don't have to resolve everything. And I'll give you the classic examples. Both Arminianism on the one hand and classic Calvinism on the other hand are very logical systems. They absolutely are. They make sense. You follow it right down the line. They all cohere. They all fit. They all make sense. The problem in my judgment is the scriptures are not that nice, neat, and clean. That's why I'm not a five-point Calvinist. I, I have tried. I have worked. 
Uh, I've given my, some of my really, 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 really good friends, let them take their best shots at me, and I just cannot get to limited atonement. I just can't. There are too many scriptures that speak so, in my mind, plainly and cleanly and clearly to an unlimited or general atonement, at least on some level. It, it's just, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do First John 2, 1 and 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, but not ours only but for the sins of the whole world. I have a friend, I won't mention him, but uh, he wouldn't mind, I don't think, but still, we were sitting down one day, he's brilliant, I mean, brilliant off the scale, 10,000 times smarter than I am. And we were talking about this issue because he is a five-point Calvinist. And he said in a very, and he is, he's a very humble, gracious, honest person. He said in a very honest moment, he said, you know, Danny, I, I acknowledge that if I were just to give somebody the Bible and tell them to read it, the odds that they would come to particular redemption is unlikely. He says you have to, quote, theologically work yourself to get there. And I said, you know, I agree with you. I said, I think classic five-point Calvinism makes all the sense in the world. I just do. And I've got dear friends that are five-point Calvinists. Al Moeller, Mark Dever, I can keep going, Andy Davis. But I said, I just don't see how that position handles well a number of texts, a significant number of texts. And he said, well, you have to have in advance a system in which you're then going to read those. And, and I said, I think you're right. So my point again is, you say, so obviously you know where I am. I'm more here than here. I love this. I believe this. I taught it for over a decade. But I would much rather live with tension so that people get all the time frustrated with me. So, well, what do you believe about Calvinism? I said, well, I believe that God is sovereign and that he predestines and elects people to be saved, but he does so in such a way so not violate our free will and responsibility to repent and believe the gospel. Well, how does he do that? I don't know. That's God's business, not mine. <laughs> I don't have to reconcile it. I'm, I'm with Paul. I'm with Paul at the end of Romans 11. His ways are past finding out. I just know that I'm supposed to present my body a living sacrifice and allow my mind to be transformed uh, by His Word. I can do that. that. That I understand. The others, I'm not going to let go of God's sovereignty. I'm certainly not going to become an open theist. That's heresy. On the other hand, I'm not going to become a fatalist. That's heresy. So I'm going to say this. Anything that detracts from God's sovereignty, I'm against it. And anything that causes you to have less passion for lost people and sharing the gospel and inviting people to be saved. And in fact, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, pleading with people to be saved, something's wrong with your theology. Something's wrong with your theology. Paul was the greatest theologian who ever lived. He was also the greatest missionary who ever lived too. The two should not be mutually exclusive. So, let Scripture then uh, be first of all interpreted grammatically. Number eight, the doctrine cannot be considered biblical unless it includes all that the Scriptures say about it. Do not practice selective citation or proof texting. Number nine, distinguish between the Proverbs of God, which are general principles that say most of the time if you do this, this is what happens. Every time, not every time, at least not in this life. But most of the time, you do this and this is what happens. You've got that classic verse, train up a child the way he should go. And when he is old, he'll not depart therefrom. There are a lot of parents out there that are on guilt trips today because they wonder, they wonder, they wonder, they wonder, what did I do wrong? How did I mess up? Why did this child go astray? I, I, I thought I did the very best I could. They probably did do the very best they could. And in some cases, three of the four kids turned out great. And they just kind of treated them all the same. The fact of the matter is, your child does have free will, and your child can make a decision to walk away from everything you've ever taught them. Some of you did at least for a season in your life, didn't you? And God, by His grace, brought you back, but some walk away and don't come back. Now, generally speaking, you train up a child in the way that he or she should go, and when they grow older, they won't depart from it. They may stray for a while, but they'll come back. You know, you've heard these statistics in recent years about all these folks that leave the church when they go to college. We now know, like the divorce statistic, that's a myth, and it's not true. It is not true. If you're talking about people that just nominally come to church, you know, once a month, every now and then, yeah, they get to college, they walk away. If you talk about someone that has been reared in a godly Christian home, that has been taught to pray, taught to read the Bible, they've been involved in the worship of the church, they've been involved in the programs of the church, and they've been schooled in that kind of a way, the overwhelming majority of them stay with the stuff. 
The divorce statistic, you know, you hear the divorce statistic all the time, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. That is absolutely not true. There, a book just came out, highly documented, highly researched, which points out that 75% of all marriages last and make it. And if you are very active in church, and you pray with your spouse, and you read the Bible with your spouse, it's somewhere around 10% of those get a divorce. No higher than 15. You know, I knew intuitively. I, 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 I couldn't say it because there was no data out there. And then they showed how they got that statistic. They went back into the 60s after the pill showed up and after divorce began to take off with uh, no-fault divorce. And they were watching this. Well, here's the trend. So 50% eventually, all 50% are going to be in the divorce. And they just went with that. They went with that. They went with it. And nobody ever said, wait, wait, wait. Has anybody actually done any real longitudinal survey and research recently? Nope. Well, they have now, and they've discovered ain't true. In fact, you hear a lot of times only half the people are married are happy. That's not true either. More like 80%. Most folks who are married, most, not all, they're happy. They like being married. They like the spouse they got. If they had to do it over again, they'd marry the same person again. And again, it goes much higher for those that have strong religious convictions and commitments. So, again, uh, a proverb, a promise, keep those distinct. Number 10, and I alluded to this a while ago, when two doctrines taught in the Bible appear to be contradictory, accept both as scriptural and the confident belief that they will resolve themselves in a higher unity. So, page 5, uh, there's a quick uh, synopsis there from Charles Kohler, who wrote an excellent book on exposition. Uh, just noting uh, cautions uh, a preacher should make. Um, you can read that on your own. There's nothing there that's really complex. Page 6, I allude to the other day showing you a text and then the greater context that keeps spreading out all the way to extra-biblical uh, contemporary usage of a word or an idea. Page 7 is a nice summary of uh, the process of interpretation. One, we want to determine the book's occasion. Two, we want to study the key words. Three, we take advantage of cross-referencing. Good study Bibles do that for you. Good commentaries do that for you. John MacArthur's the Mac Daddy in the New Testament on doing this. Uh, number four, identify figures of speech. I'll give you an example. I was working yesterday uh, on a sermon, uh, on a lesson on uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, uh, the church at Thyatira. I call it the Jezebel church because they tolerated Jezebel. Well, in the text, uh, the, 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 uh, Jesus says um, in verse uh, 22, Behold, speaking of Jezebel, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great, great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will kill her children dead. Now just stop right there. That took my breath. That's Jesus speaking. I will kill her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Well, I pulled out uh, Dr. MacArthur's commentary on Revelation. Uh, I got about 15 on my desk. I wonder what Johnny Mac said on this. Pulled it out. Sure enough, he tracked every single time in the Bible you have that phrase, I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your own works. Now, I already had three. I knew that Jeremiah 17, 10 said it. Uh, I knew that Jesus spoke to this uh, in Matthew. Paul has something similar in second, uh, in Romans 2, I think it's verse 6, 5 or 6. Uh, Johnny Mac found it in Proverbs and found it in Psalms and found it back in Deuteronomy. So in my notes, boom, 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 I just listed them all. And so cross-referencing is very helpful. I looked them all up, and sure enough, every one of them had at least very close to the same exact word. So in other words, evidently there's a principle in Scripture that God does not want us to forget that He is the one who searches minds and hearts, and He will give to each of you according to your works. Now, most likely in the context, when he says, uh, I will strike her children dead, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that John thought the Jezebel was lost, that she was a false prophet and unregenerate. I think he makes a distinction between those who are guilty of sexual immorality, i.e., they got seduced and followed somebody they shouldn't have followed, and these who are chil her children are those who are of her own stock. Her children are those who have her DNA. 
So she's lost, they're lost, and that's why when he says, I will kill them dead, I think what he's saying is they have moved past what we call the day of grace, and so they want to go down this path, I'll help them finish it up. I will, it's Romans 1. He, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. You want to go against God, eventually God says, I'll let you have your way. And I will give to everyone according to his work, which is also a very important theological principle since we're going to do theology for a moment. Revelation brings responsibility. The more you know, the greater is your accountability. I was asked uh, last week, are there degrees of reward in heaven? Yes, just as there are degrees of torment in hell. Hell will be bad for everybody. It will not be equally bad for everybody. He will give to each according to his works. Jesus said in Matthew 11, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than Bethesda or Chorazin. For had they repented... Had I been there, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Yours is the greater condemnation. So there is degrees of reward in heaven, and there are degrees of torment in hell. Uh, scripture must never, will never contradict itself. Scripture must be interpreted literally. Please put the word naturally beside that. That's a better way of saying it. I'm just quoting Kohler there. Uh, do not develop doctrine from obscure or difficult passages. Discover the author's original intended meaning. And then check your conclusions using reliable resources. Now, tell you what, let's do it this way. I'm going to come back tomorrow when we finish up interpretation and use the Ephesians text. Let me piggyback on number seven here because it'll be helpful to you now and later. I think I actually have a lecture later where I go through some of this. And you all have uh, building a theological library, which allows you to see the kind of commentaries that we would recommend uh, from book to book to book, and they're stars by the two or three top choices that we would make, because obviously you're not in a position right now to go out and buy ten commentaries uh, on every book of the Bible. Heck, I'm not in a position to go buy ten commentaries on every book of the Bible. So what I do, and what I did was, I buy them as my professors required. That's not an option. And then I would buy them as I needed them. Now, here, of course, is the million-dollar question. Where do you start? Where do you start? Where do you begin? Well, there's one of two ways to go, and I'll lay out both, but go with the second. One is just go ahead and don't worry about how much it costs and buy the best. Well, again, the odds are you're not in a position in here to go out and buy the best no matter what the cost is. So you want to strike a balance and get what's good, but what is economically uh, feasible, all right? So if I were sitting where you guys sit today, what would I do? Well, I would start with the Tyndale. The Tyndale Old Testament and the Tyndale New Testament. You say, why? They're single volumes. Uh, they're paperbacks, which means, therefore, they're not going to be terribly expensive. And you can just buy one at a time until you may eventually wind up with a whole set. I, I may have it. I may not. You say, why not? Well, I've never preached on Job. So I don't know if I have a Tyndale on Job or not. If I decide to work through Job, I will. I'll go buy one because they're good commentaries. They're very simple, but very good at just explaining the text. They revised it, started revising it a few years ago. They got bigger, uh, but they got more in-depth too. But these are a very uh, inexpensive series. Now, let me jump ahead. Christmas is coming, and you have a mom and a dad that love you. Or maybe you have grandmama. But there's so much. Grandparents are better anyway. So you've got grandmama or granddad that really loves you. And at this stage in their life, they can do something for you. And they want to. And they say, sweetheart, I want to help you in your ministry. Uh, I'd like to buy you a set of books. And uh, don't worry about the cost. Uh, God's been good to us. And I want to buy you a set of books. That's easy. You want the Expositor's Bible Commentary 12 volumes. That's what you want. going to cost about three or $400. But overall, and again, commentaries are uneven. So in this series, they're not all equally great. Uh, some are better than the others. But overall, it is the best set out there in terms of just explaining the Bible. Just explaining the Bible. Don Carson wrote the Matthew. Uh, it's the Mac Daddy. Um, John Selhammer, who used to be here, wrote Genesis. It's outstanding. Uh, uh, Van Gimmeren uh, did uh, the Psalms. They are really, really, really good. I went through a bunch of the Psalms. His stuff was really, really, 
really helpful. So I've never used the uh, EBC and said, well, I got ripped off there. That, that didn't work. No, that, they've always been, been very, very helpful, all right? It's in process, <clears throat> but for teaching purposes, and not because I'm on the editors, but Christ-centered exposition, I really like. I skip mine, leave mine alone. I love what David's done. I love what Tony's done. I've read, just read Mark Howell's on First and Second Thessalonians to be coming out. It's really, really, really good. I haven't seen a bad one yet, other than maybe mine. So Titus wasn't good, but First and Second Timothy were because David and Tony did that. So Christ-centered exposition. They're, they're, they're worst case scenario, twelve ninety nine. But if you just wait. Lifeway, like recently, had a 50% sale on all the ones that are out. 50%. So now they're down to $6. Boom, boom, boom. Buy them. You got them. Good to go. Um, let me jump again. Money's not an object. There's still, if, if again, I could, without any reservations or, or limitations, the New International Commentary of NICOT and the New International Com ah, the New International Commentary <laughs> of the New Testament. Those are the best. Those are the best. They're absolutely the best. Um, I'm working right now through Revelation. Robert Mounts, his Revelation is really, really, really good. It's just excellent. Uh, I could go on and on and on. Uh, uh, William Lane's Mark, still the best Mark commentary, I think, that, that's been written. Uh, Leon Marsh wrote John. Phenomenal. Doug Moo, two volumes in Romans. Outstanding. I, I don't know a bad one. Uh, I like my commentary on the epistles of John, but I really like I. Howard Marshall's commentary on the epistles of John, and he wrote uh, first, second, third John in uh, the NAC. It's going to be a little bit more expensive. I'll stay over here at the pillar. Now, it's just in the New Testament right now, but the pillar, New Testament commentary. These things are really, really, really good. Uh, Don Carson did John. It's excellent. It's just absolutely excellent in every way. So I like uh, the pillar. Come back over here. I like the MacArthur New Testament. It's really helpful uh, in terms of just explaining the text, cross-referencing. Really, it's his sermons turned into a book, but it's written more like an exegetical kind of, uh, of commentary. Um, the NAC, the New American Commentary, most of them are good. That's the one that I had the joy of doing the epistles of John in. A couple of them are really bad, but, you know, um, Matthew's good uh, by Blomberg. Uh, Mark is horrible by Brooks. Uh, Luke is good by Stein. Borchardt's two volumes on John, okay. Paul Hill's Acts is the best. It's the best Acts commentary out there. Paul Hill's commentary on Acts. Timothy, Galat Timothy George's Galatians, the magnum opus. It's the best. Hands down, no question, it's the best. So the NAC, buy them one at a time. They're not super uh, cheap, but you know, watch. Lifeway has sales. You pick them up uh, when they're on sale. And by the way, used books are wonderful. Used books work just as good as new books. You know that? Same words. <laughs> and sometimes there's even comments in the margins of them. And they're a lot less expensive. When I lived in Dallas, they had this chain called the Half Price Bookstore. I knew where all 12 of them were. I was a courier for a year, and so I knew where everyone was. And when I was out currying, uh, I'd go fast, give me 10 minutes, jump in. I actually bought, how many of you had Hebrew yet? Big uh, Hebraica Stuttgartensia. Found a brand new, still in the wrapper, 10 bucks. 10 bucks. <laughs> how much did y'all's cost? About 50? That thing's an expensive dog, 10 bucks. So did you already have it? I did. Well, why'd you buy it? I just couldn't resist. I mean, there's the big monster. For, and I gave it to my son as a present when he later got to seminary and was in taking Hebrew and stuff. So go, go online, find these things. Used books are just as wonderful uh, as uh, new books. Uh, what am I leaving out? For teaching purposes, I, you know, I wouldn't use this in my paper, but the B-series by Warren Wearsby, they're really good. And same thing, uh, Kent Hughes has preached the word really good, especially, I mean, just for teaching uh, the Bible. Uh, over here, um, what else? <laughs> what did you use real quickly? I'm, I'm having brain lock. NIV commentary. Yeah, NIV application. Only problem with it is uh, almost, uh, that's not fair, a number of the writers are egalitarians. 
So you'll be reading along, and they're just doing great, explain the text, and all of a sudden you go, whoa, whoa, ho, where'd that come from? Because it's not in the text. Again, right or wrong, and I, don't care, I do care, but I don't care. You can't read the Bible fairly. You just can't be an egalitarian. You just can't. It's a complementarian book. Right or wrong, it speaks very clearly that God calls. We're, we're equal. We're absolutely equal in essence before God. Men and women equally bear the image of God. But God calls men to do a leadership assignment in the home. And he calls us to a leadership assignment in the church. Now, you can be like Paul Jewett and say, yep, that's what the Bible said, and I think it's wrong. Okay. Okay. I respect that. Because at least he's being honest with the Bible. But when these guys come on, so well, I'm an inerrantist, but I'm an egalitarian, which is what the Nat guys do, they didn't have to start that. Those, wee, wee, you know, like that guy, Co Pig, wee, they start, of course, he didn't like to squeal. They make fun of him. But they start squealing because those texts don't work like that. But they'll, all of a sudden, off they go. Like, Ooh, where'd that come from? But still, uh, they're not bad. Uh, they're not bad. And uh, some of them are really, really good. David Garland's Mark is really good. Uh, I used it when I worked through Mark, so I like it a lot. What else? Quickly. Baker exegesis. Baker, yeah, if you got the, the tools, that's where you got Shriners Romans, right? And that thing is outstanding. You got uh, uh, Osborne, I'm using right now. Grant Osborne wrote Revelation. It's good. Uh, it's, 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 it's good. It's, it's very good. Um, Stein just came out with uh, Bob Stein. Mark, it's excellent. It's absolutely excellent. But these, these are expensive. They're big. And you got to know Greek. Uh, or at least it helps if you know Greek, okay? Something else. Which one? Pulpit. I've got it. Looks really pretty on my shelf. I never use it. What you're going to find out is there's certain commentaries like the pulpit, like um, Matthew Henry, like Jameson Fawcett Brown, like Adam Clark, which you can get for a song, all of them. You, you like them, or, or like my wife, my, and it's, she's gonna be, no, no, she wouldn't. She loves uh, J. Vernon McGee. J. Vern McGee. Well, if you like J. Vern McGee now, which is fine, you won't like him three years from now. You say, why? You just will, from your studies, and I don't mean this to be arrogant, will advance to a level where you just don't get that much out of him anymore. And Matthew Henry's got some great nuggets, as does the pulpit commentary, but you've got to read a lot to get a little. And secondly, they're dated. Uh, the pulpit commentary is that illustration section and stuff. And, 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 and a lot of things there, they just don't work today because we don't live back 100 years ago. So, all right, this should be helpful. Uh, we'll talk about this some more, but coming to reliable resources, here you go. All right, Grant Etheridge is in Chapel Day. Great communicator. Hope you'll be there, and uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. All right, uh, we're back. Mark. Impressions, takeaways, anything in particular stand out to you? Um, well, there were a couple of things that, that he said that kind of stuck out to me. One, um, I liked where he said that how you start is where you end up uh, right at the very beginning of the lecture tonight. On Because we, we all have our own viewpoints. We all have our own uh, interpretations of things that when we come to the scripture, we tend to go, okay, I want it to say this. Um, and we have to be careful, okay, that's not necessarily what that scripture is saying. Uh, and so we have to remove all that when we come to the scripture so we, yeah. we can really interpret what the, what the author is saying. Uh, he compared the iceberg. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, on one hand, yeah, we, we've gotten more revealed in the New Testament as, as what was in the Old. Uh, there's a lot more that, that has come about, but it's also the other way. That just a, a quick glance at the at the scripture doesn't necessarily tell us everything that's underneath, uh, and there's a lot more of the iceberg that we don't see. There's a lot more of the scripture that we don't see, uh, and how the all of scripture needs to be interpreted in all of scripture, and realize okay, this is one one narrative from Genesis to Revelation. And we can't just pick a passage out and go, okay, well, this is what it means. It's where does it fit? Where does it fall? Where, where's the deeper meaning behind it? Okay, now we can proceed. And so I thought that was really good about how I, I disagree a little bit in the fact that we know a lot more now than we did. We do to some degree, but there's a lot more we don't know unless we're actually studying it. 
So anyway, that's kind of where my brain went. Well, I, I, if you were watching the video, I, I'm, I would be kind of curious to know how many of you, when he started talking about this commentary and that commentary and that commentary, how many people just like checked out <laughs> mentally? Or if you're still tuned in, God bless you. You are a glutton for punishment. Um, it's funny, at, at seminary, you know, people do get very excited about this commentary and that commentary, and this person said this, but this person said this. And I, I don't mean to insinuate that there aren't incredible contributions that come from not just seminaries, but, you know, colleges and just academic departments in general. Uh, however, he does mention, and, and he does rightly, after, you, after you've done your work, check it with, uh, you know, a reference, or mm -hmm. you, you might check your ideas against, against someone else or others who've also studied the passage. Um, when I was in seminary, I can remember, you know, reading the commentaries and seeing this and getting very into all of the details and the minutia. And so probably for the, and I was in, sem, well, I was in college and seminary for basically 11 years straight before I was like out, which is a long time. And, uh, and then I got a, a mild correction, correction. I was 29 at the time. I got a correction from someone who was in the congregation. And they basically said it in a nice way that was incredibly painful and brutal and mean. But they said it in a way that was, I think, intended to be nice. Ernest, you, you preach like a commentary. And uh, it's like, oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> that's, that's what I've been taught to do. And uh, so it, you'll come out like a commentary if you're always in commentaries. commentaries. And, and so it, it did occur to me, well, I remember hearing something along these lines. Those ought to be the things by which you check your work, not the essence of your work. Mm -hmm. So people can, it's not that the commentaries aren't good, but when people become dependent upon the commentaries, uh, they will in essence become an academician communicating to acad academicians or uh, more along the lines what you'll see in churches, super teacher talks to other super teachers. Well, I, don't, I enjoy a good biblical discussion or an in-depth examination as much as anybody else in ministry or a seminary. And, you know, maybe I'm a, you know, armchair philosopher, or maybe I'm an intellectual, I don't know. But here's the thing, um, getting too immersed in all of that stuff makes you lose perspective uh, in two ways. And this is like a caution with regards to interpretation or over-interpretation. Uh, one, when people are overdone in the commentaries, they have a tendency to strangely get too far from the text. Mm -hmm. You could read a passage that's seven verses long and it maybe takes up a quarter of one page of material and then you read a commentary and it's 40 pages. And it's not application and illustration, it's just pure explanation of the text. And you have to at some point recognize, you know, Maybe that's not particularly helpful. And what I mean is, how, how do we know that the Bible is infallible? How do we know that it's from God? Well, it does a work on people. There's a transforming power to it. Unleash the power, don't obscure it. The, the text does need interpretation, but it's not that hard most mm -hmm. of the time. The other problem, uh, just with regards to interpretation in churches, is not only do you wind up with this weird side conversation, theological one-upmanship kind of thing that happens, you know, five-point Calvinist versus, uh, you know, Arminian or non whatever the categories are. Uh, for the most part, that's kind of a waste of time. Um, and, and here's why I, I would say that. And this maybe strikes some of you who are watching who are very interpretive, inter interpretation oriented. That's why you're here and watching. Uh, the other night, this is Wednesday night, Brett was giving the message from, I think it's Acts chapter 20, mm -hmm. where Paul, Paul talks to the Ephesian elders. And there's a lot that we can take away from that. 
But as I was giving it thought in advance of Brett going there, because I thought, I want to be kind of prepared. He might ask some questions and, and try to get me, and I better <laughs> know, you know, the passage. So I kind of, <clears throat> you know, gave it some thought before coming on Wednesday night. And uh, it did occur to me, Acts chapter 20, that particular passage, 30-something through 40-something, I think, is the only address in the entire book of, of Acts that is specifically for Christians. It's the, it's the only, well, it's the only lengthy discourse of a Christian to a Christian audience. Mm -hmm. So you think about the other 28, other 28 chapters, and obviously as Christians are reading that, the whole book is an address to us as it's the, the Scriptures, as it's from God. But it kind of hit me, you know, when Peter in Acts chapter 2 preaches, or Paul is preaching to whether it be the Athenians or, you know, Festus or Agrippa, whoever, most of the communication that happens uh, happens to people who do not yet believe. And so it, it got me to thinking, maybe rather than spending more try, time trying to make a, a simple text complicated, we should pour more effort and energy into taking what may seem to be complicated and making it simple. This is what Peter, in essence, does in his sermon. He takes these big ideas and various scriptures and he makes it simple so as to cut to the chase to a non-believing audience uh, who Jesus is. And so if Jesus is the point of the Scripture, then we obscure Jesus by over-investing in peripheral interpretive matters that really have very little implication with regards to who Jesus is. And so I, I think we may have a have a tendency on occasion in our overinterpretation and our excitement about the commentaries to obscure the truth by forgetting who our primary audience ought to be and by forgetting the simplicity of the person to whom the text points. The ideas that are expressed in the Scripture are ultimately secondary to the person to whom the Scripture points. And I get that idea actually primarily from Scripture. So as we try to interpret, uh, you know, follow all those things that he talked about and maybe check your work against a commentary. But if you're kind of new to the interpretation thing and you want to, you know, be involved more in ministry or just understanding what you're hearing, uh, don't lose sight of the one to whom the Scripture points. And the Scripture doesn't exactly, the Scripture interprets Scripture, the Scripture doesn't exactly point to Scripture, it points <laughs> primarily to Jesus, and Scripture doesn't point us in the direction of spending side room meetings talking about things that, you know, people have been discussing for 2,000 years, like five-point Calvinist, or, you know, where do you come down on this? I like Dr. Aiken's approach. Just let the tension ride, and one day Jesus is going to maybe tell us the answer, or maybe the answer is beyond our ability to comprehend even in, in eternity. That stuff is secondary um, to, to Jesus. So there's my little spiel for the evening. Hope that uh, you have a great week. Hope that uh, you stay safe, and I hope that you recognize that as an interpreter, as Mark is an interpreter, so too you're an interpreter, and so don't undersell your own ability uh, to interpret things. And let me just give you this one more illustration. I think it may be helpful in terms of, hey, you've got a contribution to make, and you could be wrong, and so could I, and then so could he. I, uh, I just saw this today from my mom. You know, I had mentioned this morning they're in South Texas. It's mm -hmm. a COVID hotspot. And uh, they had another friend pass away from COVID, uh, this was on Friday. And uh, the funeral home that's dealing with the whole situation with the, with the body says they really won't be prepared in terms of, its, uh, in terms of just the body uh, and, and their obligation until, I think it was, I can't remember what it was, sept, I think September 24th, which is like four weeks from now. Because mm -hmm. apparently that 
funeral home is backed up. Now, my mom gives me this as an illustration of, well, this is so bad down here. Well, that's one interpretation. I can go, well, it could be they went to the wrong funeral home, or it could be worse than they figured, or it could be uh, maybe somebody's taking to their taking too long on their job. I don't know. No. You get bare bones facts, and depending upon your preconceived notions or opinions concerning uh, the pandemic or the politics or whatever, you may come up with this interpretation or that interpretation. Now, you know that about yourself. When you hear news, you know, I'm filtering it through this, that, and the other. Well, so is Dr. Aiken. Well, and like so the are the people who wrote the commentaries. Yeah, the commentaries, one of the things we've got to remember is they're all tr an interpretation or a translation. I love how he threw that in there when one of the students threw out one of, uh, one of their favorite commentaries. He said, oh, you'll, you'll hate that in three years, uh, and moved on to, to something else. And it's like, well, our, our experiences change. We find different interpretations that we agree with or that we feel are more accurate, and, and so we waver back and forth. But... I like what you said about, you know, we're all interpreters, and one of the things that, that can scare a lot of people off is looking at this and going, how do I interpret this? I don't have any formal training. I don't have any. Well, it's not that hard if you look at the Scripture and really just focus on what Scripture is telling you. The passages before, the passages after will help you figure out what, what you're reading. Well, sticking so. to the facts. Fact is, there was that funeral home. Uh, they're backed up for a month. Okay, that means something. Right. Um, but I, I try to, as best I can, stick to uh, laying it out there as plainly as I know uh, and recognizing that in the end it's all Jesus. And uh, I do that. Y you, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if you're concerned or overly concerned about the response of other Christians, well, they're in the same boat that you're in, just trying to get the facts straight, doing their best in humility to understand and interpret. But if we would simply do our best, not just in conversation with other Christians, but if we were trying to do our best in communicating these basic truths with non-believers, we would, I think, be a lot more on target in our interpretation, or we'd be a lot more on target in terms of the content of what we actually communicate or what we get most excited about. I don't mean like to feel like I'm picking on Dr. Aiken. I think that's fantastic. He's a great seminary professor and a great, uh, you know, seminary president. Uh, but when it gets right down to it, the Bible gets most excited about Jesus, not the commentaries that are actually written about it mm -hmm. or everybody else's interpretations. I hope that doesn't sound anti-academic or anything. No, I don't think so. Just a little casual reminder. Um, it's about Jesus. Keep that as the focus, and you're, you're going to be okay. All right, let's pray, and we'll get out of here. Uh, Father, thank you so much for your word. We do love it. We do pray that we would handle it well. We also uh, ask that you would grant us sort of a, a patience on growing in our understanding and a confidence that you are a capable communicator. Uh, so we trust that you will help us uh, to understand and that you will help us to bridge all of these gaps, whether it's a cultural gap, language gap, theological gap, and the, the gaps are there, but you're the God of the gap. If you filled the gap in Christ, you can fill these other gaps too. So we trust in you, and in the meantime, Lord, help us not to be uh, so uh, overwhelmed or filled with self-doubt that we don't read your word and interpret your word and most importantly communicate your word because uh, what does come across crystal clear really in in every passage of the bible is uh, the glory of jesus so may we be faithful to your word and faithful to teach it uh, because in spite of the peripheral issues the uh, the light uh, of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ does shine through, and may we let it. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Hope to see you soon. Have a great weekend.